morning and welcome to worship on this 23rd Sunday after the day of Pentecost. And I was on holidays this past week, and so I, I, or a week ago, and I really enjoyed the time away. It was just like this past week, actually, where we kind of experienced the four seasons of the year all in one week. We sometimes we have sunshine, and we have warmth, we have 20 degree temperatures, and then we have freezing cold temperatures, and the snow flies, and all of those things, all in one week. Oh, man. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a lovely place to live, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Ask me again when it's 40 below, and I might have a different answer. But good to be here worshiping with you this morning, and uh, pray that you will be blessed by the hearing and receiving of God's word as we share this time together. I invite you to uh, lift up your voices in song as we join in our opening hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past.
Our first reading is recorded in Joshua 24, verse 1 to 3a and 14 to 25. <coughs> then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Skeshem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offsprings many. I gave him Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed, and the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forget your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statues and ordinances for them at Skeshem. The word of the Lord. The second reading is lo located in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. The coming of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, 
that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. they carry this gigantic purse with them. Well, I bet you've experienced why they carry this gigantic purse with them. Have you ever been out on the playground playing with your friends, having a great time, and oh no, the worst thing happens. You fall, and your knees all scrape up. Oh, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Well, what does grandma or mom have? Ha ha, got my band-aids. Got my band-aids with me. Good thing I brought my big purse. Or maybe you're in the car and it's been a long journey, it's been a long, long drive, and Mom, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And Grandma or Mom looks in their purse and says, Well, I don't have much to eat, but I got some mints. Maybe that will help. Yeah, that will be good. Yeah, yeah, that will help a lot. Actually, i got to share with you. Somebody, a friend of mine gave these to me, and on it it's, written senior moments memory loss mints. But I think if I shared them with you children that would be all right too. So yeah, there's always some sort of a snack or something really sweet in, in mom or grandma's purse. And now these days when we've been out and about and maybe you've been to various stores with mom shop and maybe it was for your new clothes when you started 
started school and you, you just didn't have a way to wash your hands and so what do you suppose is in mom's purse? Well, of course, we've got whoops, some hand sanitizer because you couldn't wash your hands. So good thing mom brought her big purse along, right? Yeah. What else do we got in this purse? Let's see what else there might be. Oh, oh. Maybe mom's dropping you off for school and it's picture day. What do you need on picture day? Do a little placing up there. You look great. Good thing that was in mom's purse. And then, huh, it was the first day of school. You were so excited. Back with your friends. It was great, great fun. And then mom come to pick you up after school and, and yeah, God, it's so dream. Well, not to be outdone. What does mom have in her purse? Her umbrella. And you got to walk home all dry from school that first day. Mom's pretty prepared, isn't she? She's got all she needs in the, well, not all she needs, but quite a few of the things that she needs in this purse, and she brings it along with her. Not because she thinks it's going to rain, or not because she expects you're going to fall on the playground, but just in case. Mom brings that along. We have a parable before us today that I think talks a little bit about that being prepared for what might happen. If, if I don't know if you heard the story, if you were listening when I was reading the gospel text, but it's a story about these ten young ladies, and they've been chosen to be bridesmaids at a wedding. But it's a kind of a different wedding than we're used to. The bridesmaids aren't all with the wedding party. They're waiting at the place where the party's going to happen, waiting for, for the bridegroom, for the, the fellow to show up, the husband to show up. And so they're waiting there, and it's the bridegroom, who knows what's happening. Maybe the pictures didn't go well. Maybe he got stuck in traffic. Maybe who knows what happened. He takes a long, long time to get there. And when he finally does, it's dark. And these ladies have all brought along a lamp to, to make sure that if it does happen to be a little bit dark, that they'd have some light. But it's been a long time, and so five of the ladies didn't bring any extra oil for their lamp. And so their lights are going out. And so the other five get to go in with the bridegroom, because the other ones have to go off and get some, get some more oil for their lamp. And I got thinking about that idea of the light, and how we need to keep our lights burning. And it reminded me of something. It reminded me of... baptismal candles and how if you remember or maybe you don't remember your baptism but maybe they, your uh, parents or maybe your family have talked to you about it when you're baptized a member of the congregation takes a candle and lights it and gives it to you I mean if you're a baby gives it to mom and dad or, or maybe the people that are your, your godparents and then they say these words let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now I thought about those ten young ladies. And what if, rather than saying, no, go get some oil for your lamp yourself, what if they would have said, hey, you know what? I got lots of light in my lamp. Come on and come on in with me. And they shared their light with those around them. Think that that's what Jesus is calling us to do this to be. To fill up not our bag, but our hearts with kindness and love and generosity and friendliness and faithfulness and all of those things. That's our light. We may not be carrying that baptismal candle around with us everywhere we go, but the light that was given to us at our baptism is within us. And I pray that we would be that light to share with others. That when somebody falls in the playground, you don't laugh. Oh, your mom's got bandages in her purse. No, we say, let me help you up. Let me take you into the future or find your parents or all of those ways that we can care and love one another. And also to live out our faith, to let our light, the light that Jesus gave to us in our baptism, shine bright through, through each of us all of the time. Let's Gracious God, we give you thanks that you did indeed give us light, that you do fill us up with all of the wonderful things that you've taught us through your time here on earth. 
I pray that you would inspire, that you would spark light and love in all of the children and in each of us, children of God at any age. We pray that as we share this light together, that we would be kind, that we would love, that we would care, and that we would follow in the steps of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now, this question could be to children or to parents or to whomever. Has anybody here ever had to wait? What a dumb question, Linda. Of course we have, right? We've all had to wait at some point in time or another. And there's been in our lives several types of waiting. Maybe you're waiting for an appointed time or an appointed thing. Like maybe, um, well, we always know, we've just celebrated Thanksgiving. When is Thanksgiving? Every year? Second Monday in November, right? Second weekend in, or in October, sorry, a, a month ahead of myself. Or when's Valentine's Day? Does it move around? No, February 14th, right? So if, if that's a big the holiday in our lives, we anticipate that, we wait for it, but we know it's coming. We can mark the days off on the calendar for those things, or, or our birthday, or the anniversary of our marriage, or all of those things. We know the appointed day, so we're, we may, in anticipation and excitement, wait for those things, but we know we can see when they're going to come. Or maybe there's the unexpected wait. I remember a few weeks ago, we had... The reader who was going to read for us got caught behind the train. And so she breezed in just at the last moment because she got caught behind the train. One of those unexpected ways. Or illness that creeps up on us. We don't expect it. We don't anticipate it. We're certainly not waiting in, in anticipation for it. And I kind of thought, you know, a birth of a child is kind of that unexpected way as well. We don't ever know, like we thought, the doctor says this date will be the due date, but haha, if he comes, when the baby will come. So sometimes that can be a little bit unexpected. And then I think there are things in our lives that we, the wait is uncertain. We don't know, have any idea when it's going to come, what, when this is going to come to pass. I think just living our lives is that. Do any of us know the hour or the day? No. Right? I mean, so that's kind of that unexpected way. I mean, we live each day in hope and joy for the, the life that God has given us. But we don't know when the Lord might say, it's time to come home to be faithful servant. And another thing that's very real in our lives right now that we're kind of thinking, when is this going to end? This pandemic, right? This pandemic that we just don't know when it's going to end. So as we think about all these different types of waiting, do you have a plan for while you're waiting? Are you prepared? Is there a preparedness plan that you have for, for these times of waiting? Well, I think the type of waiting might kind of dictate how that question is answered. Many times our planning and preparing serve us very well. I wonder who came up with the fundraising idea to put birthdays and anniversaries on a community calendar and then sell it. Genius! I'm sure that many, uh, many more phone calls and birthday wishes and anniversary wishes have been made because of this calendar. Oh, it's your birthday! I better give you a call up or Facebook for that matter too. And how many of you have a crossword puzzle book in your cars <laughs> for those unexpected weights at the train? I do. Thumbs up for those of you who do. Planning and preparation. It's good to do, but sometimes hard to know what to do as well. Robert Burns in his poem, To a Mouse, recounts his experience of turning over a mouse nest in the field as he plows. And he ends the poem with the famous line, The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. In hindsight, I'm sure all we can all attest to that. No amount of planning or preparedness can anticipate every single circumstance that may come our way. Today we have before us that parable of the ten bridesmaids, a story at least on the surface that talks about planning and preparation. 
So let's just imagine this story of all the young girls or women in that community. These ten have been chosen to be the bridesmaids for the bridegroom. The anxious is the waiting for who would be chosen is over. Now imagine these girls as they come together at that door waiting for the bridegroom to get there. They're probably all giddy and excited. They just can't believe their good luck, good fortune. They're all off to a party, all ten of them. They've been invited. But our story takes a bit of a sour twist. For five are labeled foolish and five are labeled wise. And in the end, it's the wise who enter with the bridegroom and the foolish are turned away. Seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Really, both the foolish and the wise had brought along all that was needed. Lamps filled with oil. They acted the same. All of them waited. All of them fell asleep. Who could have anticipated such a long delay in the bridegroom's arrival? According to Robert Farrar Campoli in his book, Kingdom, Grace, and Judgment, the foolish represent the wisdom of the world. They live by what you they live by the what you see wisdom that God has made foolish. The wise represent the wisdom of faith, the wisdom of trusting in the foolishness of God through Christ crucified, the wisdom of living by the reality of the party to which the bridegroom has invited all of creation. Both the wise and the foolish have what they needed for now, just as the faithful and the unfaithful have identical shares in the world's goods and ills. Only the wise have faith and trust in the presently unseeable and unknowable bridegroom. And so they waited together. Matthew is sharing this parable, and Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians are both writing to a people who are struggling with the waiting. Paul believed and taught that the second coming of Christ would happen in his lifetime. And Matthew is speaking to a people 30 years after the resurrection and who believe as well that Christ will come again very soon. And here we are now, 2,000 years later, hearing those same scriptures. And over that span of time, some of us have fallen asleep. Some have turned to other gods. Some are frustrated. We're growing weary of the waiting and, and are turning to the wisdom of the world for sustenance. We can see and feel and touch that. The kind of waiting that Matthew is encouraging through this parable is hard. Waiting for something that is long overdue, waiting for something you're not even sure will come to pass is very, very hard. Waiting that involves active preparation when we're not sure even what we should be preparing for is very challenging. What do we bring along this journey? Where do we to be, what are we to be doing to prepare for something that we have no idea what it would look like? There is hope. Waiting is something we all share, something we're all accustomed to whether it's waiting for Christmas or your birthday, waiting for that phone call from someone special in your life, or waiting for the mail to arrive with a special letter, waiting for the pain of your loss to lessen and for life to be easier again. Waiting can be a time of anticipation and excitement, but it can also be a time filled with anxiety and uncertainty. Whether what we're waiting for is good or bad hardly matters. The anxiety and stress of living in that in-between time of waiting can be very difficult. This parable reminds us that we are not alone in our waiting. Did you notice how Jesus began the parable? He says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. This parable speaks into every time and place. We are living right now, so then, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. It's not a description of the kingdom of heaven like the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast or the pearl in the field. This parable speaks of the ever-present breaking in of the kingdom of heaven in every time and place. Jesus tells this parable 
in his own in-between time, his own ending. A few weeks ago, I shared where we find ourselves in Jesus' earthly journey in this ending of the season of Pentecost. This parable is set between Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the hosannas and the palm branches and his trial and crucifixion on the cross. All of the gospel writers agree that Jesus knew what was coming. And in each of the gospels, he predicts his death and resurrection. And yet here he is, teaching the crowd, facing off with his opponents, and guiding his disciples for the days that follow his death on the cross. Jesus knows how difficult waiting can be. He experienced it firsthand, and so it can genuinely be with us in our waiting. We all are waiting. So what is it you're waiting for? For the church to be normal again? Maybe you're waiting for some test results or, or a letter in the mail that will say that your investments are rising or whatever, one of those things. Maybe you're waiting for a loved one to come back home from wherever they've been. Maybe you're waiting, I think most people would agree, but they're waiting for that COVID-19 to end. Is any of you think that you're waiting for something coming up right? I didn't wake up this morning, and the first thought on my mind was, I wonder if Jesus will come to me. Waiting for Jesus' imminent return is not top of mind for most of us. Maybe we don't actively think about it, but I suggest there are opportunities all around us that show the presence of Christ with us here and now. Dirk Lang shared in his commentary on this parable of the Ten Drive Saints, he writes, the second coming of Christ becomes not a one-time event at some end point, but rather a continuous event that involves us, the community of Christ, in our baptismal vocation, living the light of the cross in mercy, not judgment. The feast to which we have been invited is the Lord's Supper. The second coming is not a far-off event, but Christ's continual presence with us through all our waiting. And as we wait, each time we work to bring justice into the world, we testify to that light of Christ. Every time we bear one another's burdens and joy, we testify to Christ. Every time we advocate for the poor, the oppressed, the outcast, or work to make this world God's loves a better place, we testify to the presence of our risen Lord among us. This kind of waiting and preparation can be very difficult to sustain. We do grow weary in our work. We're frustrated when we don't see results right away. Or we're distracted by the thousand and one other obligations that fill our lives. On any given day, I find that I am probably more like one of those foolish five things than I am like one of the wise. I'm lured into the wisdom of the world that looks after me before anyone else and that takes care of the immediate with no regard for the future. I pray that as a church, we would be the place of welcome, support, and care for both the foolish and the wise as we wait for the mundane and the fantastic, for the frightening and the joyful, as we wait for those unexpected and expected turns and twists of our lives as we seek to follow Christ. I find it striking that Paul, who is clearly speaking to a people who are, are asking the question, well, well, what about, like you said, Christ was going to come real soon. What about all of our loved ones who have died? What will happen to them? And Paul is saying, the dead in Christ will rise. And he ends this portion of his letter to the people of Thessalonica who found their waiting almost intolerable with these words. Therefore, encourage one another. That's who we are as the church, the people of God. We are those who wait with each other. 
We are those who sit together in times of pain and loss, who celebrate achievements and console disappointments. We are the words of hope when all seems lost, comfort when the burdens are heavy, and courage when the mountain is high. In all these ways, we encourage one another with the promises we have in Christ. We continue together as the body of Christ, as we wait and work and live God's mission to God's creation. I give thanks for each of you and the gifts and talents, your honesty and integrity, and the things you bring as we wait and as we walk this road together. May God bless us. May the Spirit challenge and guide us, and may the light of Christ shine in and through us. Amen. Thanks be to God. We join together in our hymn of the day, In Jesus I Have Promised. Born of the Virgin Mary, 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <coughs> Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray, Pray in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look, Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in the of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, <coughs> forgiveness, and remission of all our sins. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And I invite you to share that greeting of peace with your neighbors. Peace be with you all. And at this time in our service, we would normally gather our offering as we were so accustomed to do many, many it seems like years ago, really only it's almost eight months ago that we last did that together. But I, as you think about, I mean, certainly supporting your church congregation financially, but also to think about that light of Christ that lives within you and, and that bag of stuff that God has placed and Jesus has placed on our hearts, that love and kindness, that faithfulness, that generosity, all of those things are the gifts that you give to God's creation. So give thanks for those as well. And we join together in our offering him. Christ, 
at Fairview Bible Church. May our harmonies of prayer and praise be a blessing to all who see and hear them. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy is great. Holy Creator, surprise and delight us with the beauty of the world you have made. Bless the work of landscapers, architects, and artists who work whose work invites us into sustainable and careful living in your creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your Her mercy is great. Holy Judge, <coughs> let justice roll down like waters over this world, reign over the courtrooms of every land, in the hearts of those who guard the law and those who stand accused of crimes. Be present in cases where we long for both justice and mercy to prevail. Guard the hearts and minds of all who govern. We pray for integrity, honesty, equity, and justice for the leaders of countries, mayors of towns and cities, reeves and governors of municipalities and counties. We pray especially for our sisters and brothers to the south who are in the midst of deciding who will be president of their country. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy. Holy <coughs> console those who feel lonely or abandoned. Share the, out, share the hours of those who live and eat alone. Comfort those who have few friends or who struggle with their identity and place in this world. Equip us with the vision to see the loneliness and suffering of those around us and give us the words and actions to be the hope that is so desperately needed in their lives. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. Holy Protector, be with all observing Remembrance Day. Guard the lives of active duty and retired military personnel, and comfort all who mourn those who have died in the line of duty. Heal the wounds both physical and mental ex experienced by service members. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Healer, shine the light of your comfort and presence upon all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for those in hospitals, our straw and holy stuff, for those ill or recovering at home, Ted Reeves, Connie Angel, Wayne and Norma Erickson, Martha Rooney, Helen McGovern, Deanne Larson, Rudy Martinson, Dorothy Carlton, Agnes Weigel, and Sam Police, and in our care facilities, Lori Dombrowski, Burnett and Arlene Olson, Rose Cole, Margaret Dick, Jean White, Clarence Lenz, Jean Barthes, Carl Sunquist, Ellie Moe, Ed Hapke, Edna Hapke, Evelyn Sent, Lily Dazendelski, Jean Straub, Debbie Lynn, Martha Weinlander, Jenny Fontaine, Marion Solberg, and Margaret Elias. May they know the promise of your care in this life and to the next, the care and compassion of doctors, nurses, cooks, and cleaners who seek to make their lives as comfortable as possible. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy parents, all that we have and all that we are is yours. You love each of us as though we were, there was no other person on earth, and you love us all equally and with grace and mercy. We give you thanks for the diversity of your creation and your people, for the people from other countries who have come to be our neighbors, for the friends we have known all of our lives. We praise you for showing us the way of love and community. We celebrate with joy the milestones of our lives. The birthday celebrated this past week. Dusty Keller, Bradley Ripley, Linda Forsley, Lowell Steinman, Austin Urbanowski, Russ Hansen, and Dustin Kendall, and for the anniversaries of Mary, Alan and Susan Lee, Ed and Karen Lister, and Arnold and Barb Whitman. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. Holy and immortal one, we pray in thanksgiving to the lives of all who have died. Remind us of the frailty and shortness of our own lives, and inspire us to use them for the building up of your kingdom. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when we gather all creation around your throne, <coughs> where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite you to lift up your heads and hearts and receive the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. The announcements as we come to the close of our worship time together. Um, firstly, Lydia Circle, that seems a little clear, is going to be meeting next week, next <coughs> Tuesday, November 10th, at 7 p.m. here at the church. And uh, as I said a few weeks ago, Sunday School has started up once again, so we know that all children aged 3 to grade 6 are most welcome to join us here at the church in the basement Sunday morning at 9.30 for about 45 minutes of, of study together. It's certainly... Uh, this COVID has affected every single thing we do. It's, it's hard to imagine children not being able to just run around and play and be kids. But we do the best we can to keep them safe, so give thanks for that. And as you know as well, in the middle of September, we began in-person worship here at, at St. Olaf. So I just encourage you, if you feel like you're ready to just come out to, to worship together in person, know that you're most welcome here. We do have a capacity of 60. So if you're thinking about coming, maybe just give a call to the office and, and let Connie know that you're going to be attending worship the following Sunday. And finally, Pastor Greg is on holiday, so we have to pray for all the deer, whatever season it is. So he's out there hunting, so I guess we should pray for good luck for him. Because that's one of the provisions that God gave to us, right? God gave us things to eat, and so it's good that we do that. So we should thank for that. So, as we conclude our time together, let's go forth with a beautiful old hymn. This is one of the favorites in the care homes when I used to go out and, when we could go out and do services. If you ask, what's one of your favorite hymns? Oh, can we sing Blessed Assurance? So, let's sing it out loud and proud. Blessed Assurance. <laughs> So 
but it's an even better idea to carry the light of Christ in our hearts. Go in peace now to love and serve the Lord and let your light shine. Thank you.